Most of you might know me for my peaceful decor or devotional videos on YouTube. You've seen me move from one place to the next and even get married to the love of my life right here on the balcony. But I haven't really shared about how I actually got here. Although everything looks peaceful and carefree now, it hasn't always been like this. My current peace came at a high price. I had to lose pretty much everything I loved to know true peace. Here's my story of how I lost faith, lost my sanity, got hospitalized, and had to rebuild everything from scratch. Let's start with my sophomore year of high school. I fell in love with a charming boy who treated me like a princess. He made me feel needed and pursued. He once biked across the city just to see me march around at band practice. He told everyone he knew about me and prioritized me like I mattered most to him. He was like a real life prince. Believe me when I say that this boy went out of his way to show his love and adoration. And at the peak of our relationship, I remember he held me close and said, you know that I'm gonna marry you someday, right? Needless to say, I fell hard. I loved him more than I had ever loved anybody at the time, even more than life itself. I would have done anything for this boy. We were there for each other through some really tough times too, since we both came from unstable families. Our bond ran much deeper than just puppy love. I essentially relied on him for my happiness. He was my everything. But unfortunately, without the right guidance and influences in our lives, our relationship imploded dramatically by my junior year of high school. After losing my first love, I was thrusted into a deep depression. You see, just three years prior to this heartbreak, I had lost my father to stomach cancer and had no one to walk me through the grievance. My mother and I butted heads daily, so I was already a ball of trauma by the time he and I broke up. It was only a matter of time before I hit rock bottom. Well, rock bottom came one night when I was intoxicated in the back of a stranger's car. While the chaotic techno music was blasting in the background, a very clear thought entered my mind. It said, nobody truly loves you. I started crying for the first time in a long time after I heard that. I just felt utterly unwanted and abandoned. But soon after, I saw a painting of Jesus in my mind's eye, the same one my mom erected in my childhood home. When I saw that image of Jesus, I suddenly felt comfort wash over me from head to toe. I had never felt comfort like that before. That was my first encounter with Christ, and it marked the beginning of my faith journey. I attended a Christian church for the first time after seeing Jesus in that car, and I accepted Him as my Lord and Savior. I felt like God had given me a second chance so I tried extra hard in community college. Through Christ, I gained a sense of purpose and felt empowered to make the most out of my education. Eventually, I got accepted into UC Berkeley as an English major and was able to move away from home for the first time ever. Berkeley was awesome, easily some of the best years of my life. I joined the Vietnamese Student Association and met some of the most incredible, gifted people who inspired me to love and embrace my heritage. During my last year at Berkeley, I even joined Cal Hawaii and had a ton of fun performing with my Polynesian friends. I also started dating my longtime best friend who had a kind heart and a passion for scripture. My mother was also incredibly proud of me for making it to UC Berkeley and it seemed like all of our tension was gone whenever I visited home. I truly had everything going for me, so life was good. I remember at graduation, my expectations were larger than life. I thought that once I came home, 
I would experience something like a hero's welcome. I thought my mother and I would live happily together in harmony. I pictured getting married to my best friend and having a cozy little family together, going to our beloved church every Sunday. I also imagined having a thriving career as a marketing manager at an impactful organization somewhere. It all just seemed so likely to happen because of the trajectory that I was on. Turns out, that's not how life works. Instead of a hero's welcome, I received scoffing remarks from my mother because I couldn't find a high paying job. Our tension grew worse by the week, and before I knew it, we were back in our cycle of explosive arguments, traumatic panic attacks, and verbal abuse. One day, I just couldn't handle the chaos anymore, so I quickly threw some things into my trunk and left with nowhere to go. Luckily, my pastor took me in and allowed me to live in his guest room for two weeks. During that time, my beloved church was also going through a merger, so my once tight knit community now felt distant and fractured. There was a lot of tension in the leadership, and everyone was constantly stressed and gossiping about each other. I didn't feel like I belonged at all. I didn't belong at home. I didn't belong at my pastor's guest room. And I definitely didn't belong at church. During those two weeks, I had a mild taste of what it was like to not have a home. And once again, I found myself feeling like an unwanted burden. I slowly began losing my mind. One rainy night, I took an on ramp to the 210 freeway. And was hit with a sudden panic attack. It felt like all the brokenness and trauma that I had gone through had merged together into one massive black hole, and I was unable to escape from it. No glimmer of light or hope or anything even remotely comforting was able to escape from this black hole of trauma. I tore my throat screaming as I felt my sanity being eaten away. If there were any pain worse than death, It's the pain of losing your mind. I was barely able to drive at this point. Surrounding cars started avoiding me as I slowed down to a mere two miles per hour. The back of my head felt like pins and needles, and my fingers contracted like talons. I was controlling the steering wheel with just my palms. My voice had already been shot at this point, but out of desperation, I cried out to God for help. Right when I thought that it was g o i n g to be over for me, a police car showed up to my right. It wasn't pulling me over, it was just cruising next to me, almost like it was escorting me off the freeway. I felt a strange sense of comfort and was finally able to calm down enough to exit the freeway. I pulled into a small street and called the only safe person I could think of. My friend from college. I told her that I didn't feel well. I couldn't breathe or relax my hands, and that I didn't trust myself to be alone that night. She helped me calm down and instructed me to meet her at the local hospital, where I checked myself in, hoping to just get some emergency mental health assistance. I had no idea that I was signing up for a truly hellish experience. Instead of providing any sort of therapeutic rehab for my mental state, the hospital transferred me to the local mental institute at midnight, where I was confined with two other mentally unstable women. The women cooed and shrieked and hollered all night. I was already scared and lonely as it is, but when I arrived at the institute, the EMTs confiscated my phone and belongings and left me strapped to the stretcher while they went to sign some paperwork. I remember a delirious woman came wandering out of her room and started hopping towards me. I cried out to the EMTs for help, but they were still inside the office. The woman arrived at the foot of my stretcher and started studying me. Then, with a stroke of mania in her voice, she whispered, Do you have faith? Do you have faith? God is gonna punish you. And a slur of other unintelligible things. Luckily, the EMTs came out before it got worse and escorted her back into her room. 
I had never felt so terrified and lonely in my life. I wouldn't wish this feeling on my worst enemy. Before the EMTs picked up the stretcher and left, one of them slipped me a piece of paper and said, Somebody left this for you. On the piece of paper was a sloppily written phone number. When I recognized the first three digits, my heart sank. It was my boyfriend's number. He somehow found out that my things would be confiscated, so he quickly wrote down his contact and asked the EMT to give it to me. It was one of the kindest things I'd ever experienced. That thoughtful gesture alone helped me survive the horrifying 72 hours in that decrepit institution. After I got out, I was determined to never be thrown back in there again. I sought therapy consistently, quit my toxic workplace, found a new job, moved out, and accepted that my romantic relationship was coming to an end. Let me tell you, it wasn't easy. Just because you're determined to get better doesn't mean that life will get easier. I didn't know why so many traumatic things were happening to me, but it drove me to unlearn everything I thought I knew about God and start from square one. The sincere prayer by the author, Nabil Qureshi, captured my thoughts perfectly. He prayed, I don't know who you are anymore, but I know that you are all that matters. You created this world, you give it meaning, and either you define its purpose or it has none. With this stubborn mission to understand who Jesus really was and whether I could trust him despite all my pain and suffering, I delved deep into research. I was determined to find out the truth about God because it just didn't make sense to me why an all-loving father would be so cruel to his children. Through my research, I learned that the Christian God isn't in the business of meeting my expectations. He's in the business of defying them. He is not to be my genie. He is to be my God. I found out that I'd been worshiping not the God of the Bible, but an idealized version of the genie that I wanted. I prayed to him to give me an easier life and got angry at him when life got even harder. Because he didn't meet my expectations, I even came close to renouncing my faith. I truly thought that God wanted my happiness, but instead, he wanted my heart. And at one point, I'd even confused him for the other spiritual leaders in my life, people who have hurt me deeply. It turns out that God isn't like us. He is neither sinful, nor cruel, nor traumatized. He never promised us the perfect life, but he did promise that we would have peace throughout our tribulations. He never promised that we would always be happy, but he did promise that we would have lasting joy. He never promised to give us all the answers, but he did promise to give us direction and purpose. That is the God of the Bible, the living God, whom I sorely misunderstood. I eventually found a humble job as a copywriter at a startup. I remember being asked this very interesting question during the interviews. They asked, if you could write any book you want about any topic at all, what would you write about? At the time, I just held my head down, discouraged at the thought that there was nothing of value I could really add to the world. Little did I know, that question would follow me for years to come. The longer I held on to my faith, the more God showed me his true character. And he is so much more vast, brilliant, and loving than any God I could have ever imagined. The book of Numbers chapter 23 verse 19 says, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? Sure enough, he slowly led me out of the wilderness, out of my old twisted ways of thinking, and into a place of understanding and healing. He saw the path that I was on and the distorted mindset that I'd had. 
and he saved me from repeating the same generational curses as my forefathers. God single-handedly exposed the wounds I didn't even know I had, and he brought me out of despair. The book of Romans chapter 5 says, Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. This slow revelation convinced me that God had a better plan for my life. It was clear that my way wasn't working. So, with arms wide open, I invited him to truly take over as my God. My expectations didn't matter anymore. My happiness was of no importance to me. He could take it all. My job, prestige, relationships, my health and expectations. All I needed was to be in his presence. When I finally found my peace and fulfillment in Jesus alone, he gave me life to the abundance. I waited and worked on myself until I felt ready to reconcile with my mother. I reached out to her gradually and listened to her story with empathy. After many tries, our relationship finally became restored and I was able to give her an early retirement. I also went on to meet the community of my dreams. If my soul was like a plant, then my community was like good soil. They provided such a safe and welcoming space for me to be myself and to thrive. This amazing group of friends also stood by me as I married the love of my life. And guess what? I finally know what it is that I want to write about. This precious story of healing that God had given me. I recorded all the invaluable lessons I learned from start to finish in a book called the Abundant Life Devotional Journal. I truly hope that my devotional journal will jumpstart the healing process for you as well. You can find the link for it in my description. May you be inspired to come to yourself, conquer your traumas, and live the abundant life that was always meant for you.